everybody from the media, is everybody set up or does anybody need a minute or two? We all good? Okay. Thank you. All right, very good. We're going to get started. Good morning and thank you for attending this very important news conference. I'm Trooper Anthony Petrosky, Troop N, Community Service Officer and Public Information Officer. Today we're providing the current case status of the Maurice Chivarella homicide investigation. After the news conference, you will be given a media packet. Inside this media packet contains all of the posters that we have here, a case overview, and a list of the dignitaries that are, that are up here that I'll be announcing shortly. Please use these to provide accurate information to the public. I would now like to introduce dignitaries who are in attendance today. When I introduce their names, they will raise their hands so you can identify them. Captain Michael Carroll, Troop N Commanding Officer. Lieutenant Devin Prutoski, Troop N Criminal Investigation Section Commander. Sergeant Ryan Stefanik, Troop N Criminal Investigations Section Supervisor. Corporal Mark Barron, Troop N Hazleton Patrol Unit Section Supervisor, Lead Investigator of the Marie Chevrolet Homicide Investigation. Trooper James Kiros, Troop N Hazleton Criminal Investigation Unit Member. Captain Brian Tobin, retired former Troop N Criminal Investigation Section Supervisor. Lieutenant Daniel Gentile, retired, former Troop N Criminal Investigation Unit Assessment Member. Corporal Sean Williams, retired, former Troop N Criminal Investigation Assessment Unit Member. Corporal Thomas McAndrew, retired, former Troop N Criminal Investigation Assessment Unit Member. Trooper Donald Good, retired, former Troop N Criminal Investigation Unit Member one of the initial case investigators. Luzerne County Deputy District Attorney Daniel Zola. Mr. Eric Schubert, genealogist, ES Genealogy. Mr. Ronald Chivarella and family. We will answer any questions that you may have. However, I respectfully ask that they be held until the end of the news conference to allow for each speaker to fully deliver their remarks. I would now like to introduce Lieutenant Devin Brutoski, Troop N Criminal Investigation Section Commander. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to first thank the Chivarella family um, for believing in us and Pennsylvania State Police, uh, all our investigative skills, I talked to Ron and Carmen Marie this morning. Uh, about four years ago when I took over the section, um, I promised them that we would do our best to solve this case. And we're here now. So I do appreciate all their support. I'd like to thank the media for bringing the attention to this case. Obviously, it's almost 58 years old. And uh, it really means a lot to us to share this uh, with the rest of the country. I'd also like to thank my troop commander, uh, Trooper, or I'm sorry, Captain Michael Carroll, and uh, retired Area Commander Major Sherman Shadle. Uh, he's not here today, but I want to thank them for trusting us to solve this, uh, giving us the ability um, to use, use some money that wasn't afforded to us earlier in this investigation uh, to bring this to a, to a conclusion. Uh, on the board over here, we have a bunch of people we'd like to recognize for assistance in this case. Obviously, the Chivarella family, our former PSP investigators, uh, ES Genealogy and Mr. Eric Schubert, uh, our PSP DNA Laboratory in Greensburg, uh, their captain's here, I'll point him out in the back. Uh, they helped us tremendously at the end. Uh, a lot of DNA, a lot of swabs went to them. They were very good at getting to, uh, getting to those samples and providing them back to us what our, our, uh, <clears throat> what our results were. Luzerne County District Attorney's Office, uh, Luzerne County Coroner's Office, uh, specifically Dr. Charles Siebert, he uh, assisted us with the exhumation, uh, getting what we needed for DNA to process. Uh, Cavalry Cemetery, which is down in Drums, uh, was the cemetery that we had to go to for the exhumation. They were great. Uh, Wilkes-Barre Burial Vault Service. Uh, I'd also like to thank the relatives of the accused. Uh, many people, you can pick your friends, you can pick the job you have, but you can't pick your relatives. Uh, I was thankful for them for providing samples, knowing where it could lead, that it could be one of their family members that committed this crime. And I, and I do have to say, I do thank them for that. Uh, and any other law enforcement agency in the past, uh, when this started, typically it was word of mouth. Investigators drove miles and miles to investigate or, or look into certain 
people that they, they may have believed committed this crime. We went New Jersey State Police, New York State Police, uh, Ohio State Police. It, it spanned uh, the greater mid-Atlantic uh, when this started, and, and all those investigators and all those other agencies, we do appreciate their help. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to go through a little bit of the specifics for the case, kind of walk you through where it went. And again, as, as Trooper Petrosky said, at the end, we'll answer all your questions and uh, we'll identify uh, our accused slash suspect here in this case. <clears throat> so as we all know, on Wednesday, March 18th, 1964, at approximately 8 a.m., Marie Shiverella left her house at 533 North Alter Street, Hazleton City. She walked in a north direction towards St. Joseph's <coughs> Parochial School, and she was last seen near 6th Street, and uh, it was North Laurel, Laurel or, I'm sorry, 6th Street and um, Church Street. That's about the last time she was seen. Uh, that was about 8, 10 a.m. Uh, on that morning. At approximately 1 p.m. on March 18, 1964, her body was discovered in a stripping hole that they used for refuse uh, off of Airport Road uh, near, near the airport, so the Hazleton Municipal Airport. The investigation re revealed that Maurice was physically and sexually assaulted and murdered and left in the stripping hole. However, all her clothing and all her belongings were there with her. For the first 40 plus years, the Pennsylvania State Police worked this case with old fashioned police work. They went out, they interviewed people, they sent teletypes, they interviewed other people and it went word of mouth. Who do you think could have committed this? Uh, who could have committed this crime? Uh, without that, they were using, with, with all that being said, they were using tangible physical evidence uh, to try and solve this crime. We have moved in a different direction here uh, as, as we got into DNA evidence through the 90s. Uh, Pennsylvania State Police was founded in 1905, so over half of our existence, we've investigated this case. During the last 57 years, generations of troopers, as you see here, um, have worked this and given it special attention due to the nature of this investigation and the murder. In 2007, the Pennsylvania State Police DNA lab developed a suspect profile for, from the killer's bodily fluids that were left on Maurice's jacket. <clears throat> Shortly thereafter, the DNA profiles for all the original suspects that we had were submitted to the lab. Unfortunately, when they came back, none of them, none of them were the same. So we had to eliminate those suspects. In 2007, they also used the DNA profile and uploaded it to the databases and it, it was checked monthly for all these years. So for 57 years, that profile was checked monthly against all other criminals that had DNA in the system. We're gonna jump from 2007 to 2018. Uh, when 2018 hit, we utilized Parabon Nano Labs, uh, which a lot, of, a lot of the news stations have been showing uh, the news conference we did in 2018. They developed a snapshot phenotype facial feature of what the suspect would look like. I'll let that to everybody out there when we show you the suspect if you think it's, if it's something similar or not. Um, however, we got numerous tips. We followed numerous leads. None of them proved to be viable from that news conference. However, what Parabon did do for us is they sent a DNA sample into a, a file called GEDmatch. And within GEDmatch, it's a genealogy database and your DNA is compared to other people in that database, and we got a match. Our match was very distal. That came in 2019. It was very distal, which means, uh, I believe it was a uh, sixth, sixth cousin, approximately. Something. Somewhere around like sixth cousin, so very distant match. Um, so we conducted research trying to find out what family members were related using genealogy. In 2020, we came to an agreement with the Luzerne County District Attorney's Office to work with Mr. Eric Schubert in ES Genealogy. Mr. Schubert began immediately on our case and was working on a family tree so that we can go back and look at names of relatives of our DNA match. As we researched the list of relatives, our Pennsylvania State Police DNA lab alerted us to the fact that we never created a Y chromosome DNA profile. So your Y chromosome DNA profile is only found in males and it follows your paternal lineage. So if you're a father, your son has the same Y DNA profile as you, as well as your grandfather, great grandfather, it follows your line for paternal lineage. That was something new for us. Um, it, it can mutate, but typically when it mutates, it's off one small percent, and uh, it's typical that they find it in the same gene that mutates. So in 2020, we established that profile for a Y 
chromosome. While exploring the genealogical family names, we came across the surname of Pauli Palmino. Uh, the Palmino name was out of the Weatherly area. We recognized that name from an open homicide investigation that we had in 1972. Through that homicide, we had DNA from that homicide. We utilized that and confirmed through our lab that we were on the right ancestral track. So that was giving us the path to follow. While we were, while we were researching the genealogical track of that name, uh, we came across the name of John Palmino. He was a New Jersey State Police Captain. So we contacted him for help. He gave us our help. He gave us a family member of his that he considered to be their historian and had a family tree for everybody in his family going back generations. When we got that family tree through the remainder of 2020 and 2021, we interviewed numerous relatives from that family tree to see where it would lead. We acquired many DNA samples, and again, it started narrowing down our pool of suspects. Um, and we were fortunate enough for them to, to help us with that. So using the samples we obtained, we narrowed potential suspect lists down to four individuals. Uh, one of those individuals had been arrested in 1974 by the Pennsylvania State Police. I believe it was Trooper Guy, who's, who couldn't make it today. Um, he was arrested for involuntary deviant sexual intercourse, sexual assault, and aggravated assault. The same person who was also arrested by Hazleton City Police Department in 1978 <coughs> for reckless endangerment and harassment. Armed with this information and the ability to eliminate the other three suspects, we found our main suspect. So our suspect has been identified as James Paul Fort. Uh, he was born in 1941 and he died in 1980. Unfortunately, Mr. Fort's not alive for us to prosecute. However, he is the person that committed this crime. So with that information, we did an exhumation. Uh, on Mr. Fort out of Calvary Cemetery, which I, I talked about earlier. That was on January 6th this year, 2022. On February 3rd, 2022, we received the results from our DNA lab. And James Paul Fort matched the DNA profile from the semen stain <laughs> on Marie Chivarella's jacket. The ability of selecting an unrelated person, as the DNA profile states, is one in 480 septillion. So for somebody else to have that profile, you would need 480 septillion other people. So this is, this is an exact match. The Y chromosome also matched uh, to the Y chromosome we had on file. And uh, to put it in perspective, we did a little research. 117 billion people are to be have reported lived on Earth at one time or another. So 100, uh, 480 septillion means you would have to go through 4 million other Earths to find the same DNA profile. So we are as exact as we can be. And again, Mr. Fort is our suspect. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're not under the impression that this isn't the only crime that he may have committed, and that maybe, maybe there's people out there that this, this guy may have perpetrated something on them before. So if you do have that information, we ask you to call the state police at Hazleton. We'd love to talk to you. You can ask for Corporal Barron. Uh, Sergeant Safanik, Trooper Petrosky, or myself, uh, Lieutenant Brutoski, uh, we'd love to talk to some people if there is something else out there that, that he committed. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant. I would now like to introduce Corporal Mark Barron, who has been the lead investigator on this case. Corporal Barron. Thank you, Trooper Petrosky. Good morning, everyone. Today is a very important day for the Pennsylvania State Police. Um, it's, uh, it's my impression that this is the fourth oldest case, cold case, to be solved in the country utilizing genetic genealogy. And that's the tool that Mr. Schubert helped to provide to us. Um, 
And if it's the fourth oldest cold case in the country to be solved utilizing this technology, it's the oldest in the state. So this is a, a, a very important day for our department. Um, it's also an important day for the Hazleton community as a whole. This was a violent and a, and a heinous crime that was committed against a small child. And uh, I'm gonna get a, a motion. Uh, we're always told not to get attached to a case, but uh, you can't help it. And it's a vivid memory for everybody who lived through this. And it's a, a vivid memory for everybody who grew up in this area. You were told by a grandparent, a parent, an aunt, an uncle, this is Maurice's story. And what happened to her ushered in a change in this community. Whether you like it or not, the way you live changed after March 18th of 1964 in Hazleton. And lastly, this has been a day that this family has been waiting for for nearly 58 years. And as the lieutenant said, even though we couldn't bring charges against Mr. Fort, I, I hope that this brings some type of closure for your family. I really do. Now that I have all of that out of the way, um, I was assigned this case in 2017. And I was told by Corporal McAndrew, who's down there at the end, he was the retiring lead investigator. And he went ahead and told me that this case was solvable. And that the way that you solve this case is that somebody needed to work it. And you had to dedicate your, a lot of time to it. And uh, with that thought in mind, I spent countless hours on duty, off duty, working this case. My wife will tell you that. Um, and even after I left the criminal investigation unit, when I got promoted, I, I came back to the troop and I went to Sergeant Stefanik and I asked him if I could still be the lead investigator and he said absolutely. But uh, when you work a case that's nearly 58 years old, you work as a part of a team. And since March 18th of 1964, we assembled one heck of a team. We had over 230 members of this department that had a hand in this case in some way, shape, or form. Um, and that doesn't include the civilians that worked at the crime lab. Um, they went above and beyond trying to ensure that this case was solved. Uh, I'm gonna give a, a shout out to Tim Gavel from the Greensburg Crime Laboratory. Uh, he did an excellent job, so thank you, Tim. Um, and recently I was told a story by Sergeant Stefanik, who got it from retired Sergeant Good, that as one of the original investigators on this case, they worked this case from March 18th of 1964 through the end of July of 1964 without taking a day off. And I think that shows the incredible dedication that the original investigators gave to this case. Again, they always tell us not to get emotionally attached to an investigation, but you can't help it. And when we called Mr. Good, he knew the date of this incident like that. Um, so it stuck with him and it stuck with every member that had some, some involvement in this case. Um, so with all of that being said, special thanks need to go out to the current command staff of Troop Ben Hazelton, Captain Michael Carroll, Lieutenant Joseph Sparich who couldn't be here, and Lieutenant Devin Brutoski. Your willingness to release funds so this investigation could be furthered was greatly appreciated. Without your assistance, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't. Uh, on a personal note from myself to all the sergeants who I worked under at PSP Hazleton, 
thank you for allowing me to still work this case and work all my patrol functions. I appreciate it. That goes out to, uh, again, Sergeant Stefanik, who I named, Lieutenant Jim Denini from Stroudsburg, Sergeant Jerry Ustinovsky from Bloomsburg, and Sergeant Anthony Ferdinand. He's in the back from PSB Hazleton. Um, to Trooper James Kiros from the Criminal Investigation Unit. Field, thank you for uh, assisting me with conducting all these interviews and getting the DNA that broke this case open. And to uh, Eric Schubert of BS Genealogy, thank you for providing your expertise and guidance to this case. And then finally, <clears throat> I just want to say that this case has not only displayed the tenacity of this department, but it also has shown the great work that's being accomplished by law enforcement daily. Um, even though it took nearly 58 years for this case to be solved, I think that this should instill in the families and victims across the, the state and across the country a sense of hope. And that hope is that no matter how long it may take, we as law enforcement will never give up in trying to find the perpetrators of these heinous crimes that go on. So, and uh, God willing, in, in life or in death, you will be found. So, uh, I'll be done now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Corporal Barron. Your words are inspiring and a true motivation to all current law enforcement and past. Our next speaker is Mr. Eric Schubert from ES Genealogy. Mr. Schubert sent me an email years ago asking if he could work on our case. For the Pennsylvania State Police, that's a little outside the box. This decision paid off. Mr. Schubert provided a service that we would have never expected, and he reached out to us. We are proud to have him here, and I'm proud to introduce him to come up and speak next, Mr. Eric Schubert. Thank you, Trooper Petrosky, for the very, very kind words. Um, as was said, my name is Eric Schubert of ES Genealogy. Uh, I was the independent consultant brought on through the district attorney's office. Uh, to conduct a genealogy investigation into this case. Um, just a little bit about my background. Uh, my work with genealogy stretches back uh, over 10 years and has been featured nationally. Uh, I've assisted in several other cold cases throughout the country over the past two years. Uh, and as was mentioned, I've been involved in this uh, investigation uh, for about two years. So it's certainly something that I've been working on a very long time and it means a lot to me, uh, as I know it does to so many people here. Um, it really was a multifaceted investigation that left absolutely no stone unturned. Um, at the beginning, as was mentioned, the highest DNA match to Maurice's assailant uh, in public <coughs> DNA databases was uh, about 53 centimorgans. Uh, and a centimorgan is, uh, think of it like a, a unit of measurement for a genetic linkage. Um, you share a set amount of centimorgans with everyone in your family. Um, and 53 is very, very low, as was mentioned. Uh, but that was where we started. Uh, from there, I conducted traditional family tree research using census records, uh, military records, newspaper records, and more. Um, so we were really zeroing in on families, uh, locations, links, uh, and it took a year, but we were able to go from 53 centimorgans to almost 200, which now is really something that I can work with. Um, it was the strongest and most important lead that we had to date. Um, I'll never forget when Corporal Barron was telling me that we had just gotten that match uh, because in that moment I knew that we were going to find the assailant. Um, we quickly worked our way up from that match uh, to a match that in the end was over a thousand centimorgans. Uh, it was about 1,200. Um, that's something that you would share with a person who's a half uncle, a cousin, that sort of thing. Um, so to go from 53 to 179 to 1200 took two years. Um, and at the end of the day, those matches allowed me to identify the assailant uh, for the state police. So that is a bit of background on 
uh, the specifics on how this team did it. Um, and on a personal note, I really would like to say that um, the investigation that went into all of this work was probably the hardest uh, genealogy task that I've ever faced in over 10 years, as long as I've been doing genealogy. Uh, I would dare to say that this was probably the hardest thing that I've ever done in my entire life. And it means so much to me that I was able to be on the team that could provide answers for the Chevrella family um, and to, of course, help out the state police to close this uh, investigation. Um, with that being said, there are so many people that I want to thank. I'm sure I'm going to miss some people. Um, words can't express my appreciation for Corporal Mark Barron, who was absolutely indispensable in his role as lead investigator on the case. Um, I especially want to thank uh, Trooper Q, Trooper Q Rose, uh, Sergeant Stefanik, uh, Trooper Petrosky for uh, not thinking my email was crazy and actually <coughs> taking me up on it. Um, and especially retired corporal and former uh, DA's office detective, Sean Williams, uh, for everything they did to assist in solving this case. And like I said, there's so many people who worked on this, so that's just a snippet. Um, but this was really something that is going to stick with me for a very long time, and everyone's work in this was absolutely uh, invaluable to finding James Paul Ford. Um, their dedication, their advocacy, their support and contributions were really invaluable to this investigation. Uh, and like I said, they all played really vital ro ro roles. Um, I was 18 years old when I started working on this case. Uh, now I'm almost 21, so this is something that um, I've been working on this for a very long time, to say the least. Um, so it's certainly something that I know is going to stick with me um, because I spent so much time on it. I've been working on it practically uh, my entire undergraduate career so far in college. Um, so the people on this team mean a lot to me. They put so much into it. Um, we worked as a team and we, in the end, found the answers uh, that everyone was looking for. Um, and like I said, today I especially uh, want to say that my thoughts are with the Chivarellas, uh, especially Maurice's great siblings who I've gotten to know very well over the past two years. Um, they've waited so long to have this answer. I, of course, can't put myself in their shoes, um, but I know how hard this is. Um, and I really want to say that I appreciate all their kind words and support, um, and it's been great getting to know them. Um, their words always mean a lot, um, and it was really important to me that they know how hard this team was working over these past two years to find James Paul Ford. Um, it really is a big honor to have assisted, um, and yes, thank you so much. Eric, on behalf of all True Bandits, it's our honor to have had you work on our case. Next, I'd like to invite Ronald Chivarella, and Carmen Marie Radke, and family members to come up and provide some words. see me? <laughs> they could not lower this podium for me, so, so thanks for your uh, patience. <coughs> for those of you that, that may not know, my, my name is Ronald Chivarella. I'm the, the oldest uh, child from Carmen and Mary Chivarella. Um, I introduced my s sister, Carmen Marie, uh, my older, uh, younger brother, but the oldest in the middle is Barry Chivarella and David Chivarella. To the members of the extended family, I wanted to say thank you for, for coming today, uh, not only for today, but for the support you provided to us over the years. That's been very, so important, and I know extremely important to our parents. On behalf of the Carmen and Mary Chivarella family standing here, we really want to offer a heartfelt appreciation and admiration for the Pennsylvania State Police. 
you know, over the, we keep hearing 58 years, and that, my goodness, that was a long time. Um, but all of, over those 58 years, the, the Pennsylvania State Police routinely made their presence known continuously, so continuously through those 58 years. They visited and called and upda with updates to the family. Uh, they, they responded to questions we had. They asked a lot of questions. They provided comfort and hope. And that was a human element, you know, a, a, a bit of what Mark Barron had touched on. We've gained a very tight emotional connection to each other. And that can be a little dangerous, I believe, in a professional capacity, but it's also a, a, a treasure and a value for a family like ours that were affected by something like, like Maurice's loss. The Pennsylvania State Police were unquestionably committed to solving Maurice's case. I know that's repetition, but I'd like you, hear, like you to hear it again because it's something we feel in our hearts. Uh, mm -hmm. An expression of this comes from a March 20th, 19, 2019 press conference when Trooper Petrosky said, and I paraphrase, he said, over the last 55 years, this investigation has not stopped and it is not going to stop. So it spoke so well to the spirit and the, the dedication we had seen for the 55 years that preceded that day. Um, and and it, it kept capsulizes the motivation and, and the core values also of the Pennsylvania State Police. So although Trooper Petrosky spoke for himself, he was speaking on behalf of the family, and it also continued to give us the faith that we've had over the previous 55 years. So thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Now many, many worked on Maurice's case over the years. We've, we've touched on that. Um, you know, the family remembers individuals like Danny, Danny Gentile, who was there. And I won't start trying to figure out how long back it was, Danny, but you, you were there. You were very, very effective uh, with, with my family, my mother, my father, and so forth. And you were a valued asset, no doubt about it. Uh, I remember uh, Brian uh, Tobin, sir, you were you were there, and you you were very effective with with helping us. I re I recall Sean Williams and and retired Corporal Tom McAndrew uh, for their for their help in previous years to where we are today. So with that. Uh, our, our family wants to recognize the frontline team. You've, you've heard of portions of it, I believe, maybe all of it that I will miss, but the frontline team which solved Maurice's case, and uh, I'm gonna call out their names, and I would really appreciate it if you would stand when I, when I call your name. Uh, providing the leadership to the team has, has an outstanding job was Lieutenant Devin Perkowski. So if you would stand, sir. Our family's primary point of contact and um, a, a, as a uh, professional Pennsylvania State Trooper and, and as a uh, what became a personal friend, Corporal Barron. Corporal Barron. <laughs> Trooper, Trooper James Kiros, sir, you were out. <laughs> Sergeant Ryan Stefanik. Retired Pennsylvania State Trooper and current Chief of Police at Shikalimi, Pennsylvania, Sean Williams. <laughs> and to a wonderful individual, um, young, but he surely proved himself, <laughs> was our, our genealogist, volunteer consultant, Eric Schubert. Family, thank you so much. Ready? With 
with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carmen Marie. We have so many precious memories of Maurice. At the same time, our families will always feel the emptiness and the sorrow of her absence. Consequently, we will continue to ask ourselves, what would have been, what could have been? So how does our family further embrace a sense of closure for the harm done to Maurice? Our parents' sentiments were expressed a long time ago. They never sought punishment or revenge, but did want justice. Thanks to the Pennsylvania State Police, our family now knows the identity of Maurice's murderer. Thanks to the Pennsylvania State Police, justice has been served today. As Maurice's siblings, we will keep in mind two biblical teachings. The first comes from Romans chapter 12, verse 19, which reads, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And the second reading from Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, related to the sin of harming a child. But anyone who is an obstacle to bring down one of these little ones who have faith will be better thrown into the sea with the great millstone around his neck. So that's what our family will continue to do. Thank you all very much. I'm going to now introduce the Luzerne County District Attorney, Samuel Sang Sangla Dolce, to provide remarks on behalf of the District Attorney's Office. Um, thank you, everybody. I probably can't say too much that hasn't already been said. You know, one, uh, the appreciation for the state police cannot be overstated. Um, their continuous work on a matter at times when uh, we are often short of resources, and uh, it seems like every emer a new emergency comes up every day, uh, but their dedication to this case is really what solved it. Uh, my own Deputy District Attorney, Dan Zola, who worked tirelessly with the state police on this case. Uh, it's our great regret that we do not get to prosecute the individual responsible. However, um, I, I believe the family uh, said it best that he will face his own vengeance uh, where he is right now. Um, again, I thank you to the family for having patience and faith that eventually uh, we would come to the conclusion uh, and, and find the identity of the murderer. And thanks to the Pennsylvania State Police and the rest of my team that actually um, worked tirelessly to find the results in this case. Thank you. At this point, we would like to take questions. We will do our very best to answer these questions, if for some reason a question arises that we can't answer at this time, we will get back to you. But again, we want accurate information released. As you've heard, this is a case that has been going on for a very long time, just short of 58 years. So keeping the details of this case accurate is what our goal is for today. So I'm going to invite Corporal Barron up here, Lieutenant Bertoski, and Mr. Schubert, <coughs> Schubert to come up and answer any questions that you may have. know how he died. He uh, died fairly young. Yes, we, we Pennsylvania State Police actually, actually investigated uh, the death of Mr. Ford. He, we believe he died from natural causes, possibly a heart attack. Uh, he was a bartender at Genetti's uh, right up the street here um, at the time. I believe he, that's where he died there. He, he, he died at Genetti's. Uh, we did the investigation, so yes. And how close in proximity did the accused live uh, to Maurice? At the time of the incident, they lived on, uh, Mr. Ford lived on West 14th Street. Probably six, six seven so block. So, I don't have a question. Well, kind of. I have no idea where you came from, young man, but you need to keep going. Thank you. <laughs> Hazel eyes, like, like 
No, he had blue eyes. Blue eyes, okay. So we, in, in the beginning, <clears throat> obviously the information we had from, from the DNA, uh, we, we exhausted all those efforts into the hazel slash brown eyes, um, and then we had to come back to the other side. So it, it did not pan out on that note. The best that I can tell you is there's not a lot of information on him. Um, as the lieutenant alluded to earlier, he was arrested by our department in 1974. We can't find that report. Um, all that I could tell you from 1974 standards, he was a, uh, I think it was like a uh, bar supply, like salesman, whatever that means that was off of the uh, fingerprint card that we obtained that information. Hi, uh, good morning, Andy Mahal, Chicago East News. Uh, did Mr. Ford's name come up at all? We're living in this community, a lot of names are bantered around, possible suspects, as you know. Did his name come up at all in the early days? Maybe Mr. Good would know. Did his name come up? Was he ever on the radar at all? Hey, and here are the questions. <laughs> he, he wants to know, did, did the Fort name come up early in the investigation? No, that was foreign to me. When Sergeant uh, Stefani called, I was just sitting down in the news. had just started at uh, 12 noon. My wife and I were having a lunch. And when he called me and told me that the case was solved, and if I could come up, and so forth. And not that any of us forgot it, but there were probably, I'd say at any one time, there were 23 of us that were devoted and assigned to various facets of the case. And I don't know how I got to work on time because we were working, I would say, on an average from the day of the crime to into July, seven days a week, and I would feel safe in saying 18 to 20 hours a day. And at that time in the state police, there was no uh, overtime pay, and we worked not just the six days. The lieutenant that was running the case was Edward J. Swadai, and we would be out working, and before we went home, almost every day, we gathered in his office and <coughs> went over what was accomplished I think the wives of my colleagues, including my own, I think they were about ready to pull their hair off because we didn't have we didn't have one day off. He, the lieutenant gave a couple of the guys from Mount Pocono, Bloomsburg, because they had to travel, and once in a while he gave maybe they got two, three days off in that time frame. But it was uh, every day. I mean, you maybe go home for supper or, uh, and we'd be in in the morning. I, uh, many nights, I didn't get home till three o'clock and past that time. And we had to be back at five, six. I mean, it was just routine. And Does that mean you that name didn't ring true for you. But, and uh, that name, you were no, that, that didn't ring a bell. We, we had a, a, an initial list from, from the work they did, and I believe it was around 10, 10 names maybe. That might have been more than that. It could have been more, but, th but this was not a name on that list. We only got Mr. Fort's name in 2020, and that was through the works of uh, Mr. Schubert that his name came to light. So. 
Uh, Amanda, you just went WNEP. What, was this completely random? I mean, did, did the victim or the family know of Mr. Ford, ever heard of the name in the community back then? My understanding is that the family did not know who Mr. Fort was. As far as was it random, I would have to assume it was. But, um, you know, the unfortunate thing with this, this case with him never being interviewed, uh, you know, we're, we're going to know who did it. But all of those other uh, questions, we just don't have answers for. Do, do you guys know if um, he committed any other crimes? Heinous crimes against other kids or other people we don't, over don't, the years? Yeah, the only two things that we know of uh, are the two that I mentioned earlier. The 1974 sexual assault. Um, we won't go with the, the, the lady's name. We have interviewed her. So that was actually a very violent encounter. And I believe she felt that she could have been killed at that time. It's just somebody happened upon the incident and stopped it. Um, so we know of that, and we also know of uh, another incident that the city police arrested him for in 78, um, which he, he, it was a, a minor offense type thing, but that's the only two. And that's why I, I will put this out there. If there are people that know, we would sure love to hear from you. So uh, anybody that's out there listening to this, we'd definitely like to hear from you and, and get a better understanding of who this person was. Did he do any time, did he do any time for those two crimes? Um, the, the 1978 case, I can't speak to. Um, that's not, that wasn't ever on his um, criminal record. Uh, the 1974 case that the lieutenant's been talking about, um, he actually pled guilty to aggravated assault and got a year probation. You mentioned Mr. Ford's family was kind of was helpful in some way in terms of DNA or can you go into what, what exactly they did uh, to help you guys? So, so Corporal Barron and Trooper Kiro, Kiros were uh, basically leading this investigation. With information received from Mr. Schubert here, we would go out to certain relatives and we ask for buckle swabs, basically a swab for the inside of your cheek that gives you the cells that we can use to identify right. DNA profile. And uh, we would use that profile and match it up against the killer. Um, but also, well, he was talking about centimorgans and all that, so we, we also did utilize genealogical databases uh, that, are, that are for the public use. Um, so that would give us uh, a, a, a match as far as Santa Morgan's between, which, which he had talked about. Uh, so with all that, we would get a little bit closer at, at times. Uh, we, we did at one point uh, get his brother's DNA, because uh, as I talked, we got down to two people. Uh, we knew the, the matriarchal line of the family. Again, thank, <laughs> thanks to Mr. Schubert, we knew the patriarchal line. So we knew it had to come from this one family. And we, uh, however, both, both of them were dead. Uh, uh, the, uh, it would be his sister-in-law uh, gave us some material to work with and we were able to produce a DNA profile for the brother. Once we had that, we knew we were very close. And then we knew we had to uh, meet with the DA's office and do an exhumation. And uh, we were pretty confident at that point. We had already spoke with the Shiverellas. We told them where we were. This was gonna be our guy, but we were going to prove it. And I think we did that. And, and just to follow up for, for Eric, you mentioned you're not even 21 yet, correct? We're still but funny. <laughs> but I've heard that you've been doing this for 10 years, you said? Yeah, you I've, been, uh, I've been involved in genealogy for about 10 years. Uh, I've been involved in cold cases for about two, and genetic genealogy for about five. Um, so this is certainly a case that I've been working on for a long time, as I've mentioned, um, as has everyone else here. Uh, and it couldn't have gotten done without you know, everyone's uh, input um, and opinions and, and that sort of thing coming into the case. Has this only been in genealogy at 10 years old? Just on there, if you could save that for one second. I vetted him before we used him. He did help solve other cold cases. There was one definitely I talked to a police department in Chicago, uh, outside of Chicago. Couldn't talk any better about the man. And uh, another uh, Upper Marion? Upper Marion police in uh, outside of Philadelphia we helped with. So I did vet him so we knew what we were getting. And uh, we're very thankful for what we got. I was just going to say, how does someone get into this line of work at 10, 11 years old? Uh, I was homesick a lot when I was a kid, so I would see <laughs> genealogy commercials, and I would say, wait a second, maybe I could do that. Uh, and I thought it would be a two-week thing, and here I am. But I'm certainly thankful I started. <laughs> Uh, 
uh, Jan we did it on January 6th this year. And again, I, I, I pointed out that Cavalry Cemetery helped us quite a bit, and I, I do thank them for keeping it quiet. They Obviously, they knew where we were digging, they knew who was in, in the grave, um, and they were very cooperative with us in keeping it to themselves. And uh, we do appreciate that. Sure. Did the family, like, did they think, oh, my cousin or whatever was it, did they think they were, like, you know, a little crazy? Did they say that makes sense, or you seem like a nice guy, or did they say anything about it? Just like, the family, family yeah. like, did they think, oh, well, he's always been an odd guy, you know, or strange, or were they, like, completely surprised by, like, no, 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 we, we, they, they did not elaborate that he was a, you know, a uh, potentially violent person. Yeah. The one word I feel like that keeps coming up is the persistence of you guys and what you have done. Um, was there ever a, a time where, you know, you guys kept hitting roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. Like, what did you guys do to kind of continue to push and, and get past this to be able to solve this and, and give the family closure? Uh, I, could, I could speak at least for the three of us because we've had many conversations. <laughs> we banged our head on the wall a few times and uh, had to just regroup. And he would, he would go back and do more research for newspaper articles, uh, all the other things that he would use, uh, military records, anything we can get. Corporal Barron and Trooper Kios would, Kios would bang on more doors and, and talk to more people. We got fortunate, uh, we got lucky a few times, and sometimes being lucky is better than good. And in this case, we'll take the luck. But yes, we, we, we had some times where it, it, it wasn't fun, but we got there. Yeah, I mean, I, I saw the news reports, and at the time, um, I had previous cold case experience. Um, I was looking for my next case where I could potentially be of help. Um, and Maurice's case was, I believe, I, I remember it vividly, it was the first one I came across when I started looking for the next area in which I could help. So um, I, I certainly didn't know if my strategy of just reaching out and saying, hey, uh, I, I think I know what I'm doing. If I'm not stepping on any toes, I'd be happy to help. Uh, I didn't think that would work. But it did, and I'm very thankful for that, um, because I knew that I, I could at least potentially get this case a little closer to being solved. Uh, and in the end, you know, I'm happy we could pull it off. Yeah, what college did you attend? Uh, Elizabeth Town College in Lancaster County. And are you a junior? Or yes, junior. What's your major? History. <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe I'll have to take you up on that idea now that you've had it. Yes. I would like to know if the name Joseph Callender appeared on your list of suspects. That name, I, th there are only a handful of people that have read all, I think we're up to 4,694 pages of that case file. Um, I, I do know that name. Um, never, I don't believe, was really uh, ever hard considered to be a viable suspect in this case. But that name is familiar to me. And there's anything I'm on your end on that? From I just recall years? Joseph Callender was, uh, I believe he also confessed a crime. He was a, a Christmas Bureau employee. He was checked out. And uh, the details that he provided to the crime did not match anything regarding it, so he was something you want to do is like uh, maybe open or make a business out of it? I mean, potentially. Um, I, I started working on the case because I thought I could make an impact. I thought I could help the family. I thought I could help the state police. Uh, that was my motivation. So at, at the end of the day, who knows where uh, things will go next. But uh, if there's an opportunity in the future to continue helping a family like this, um, you know, I'm all for it. So we'll see where it takes me. The picture that was released in 2019, um, I'm looking at this, there doesn't seem to be much of a resemblance on it. Were there any more recent pictures that may have had more of a resemblance? Of, of no, and that, that of course is technology that Parabon created uh, using your DNA. 
Um, they will tell you it's not 100% accurate. We knew that, mm -hmm. uh, but we, we tried. You know, we tried to use what we could at the time. Again, as technology uh, it expands upon itself and it gives us more things to use, we were using everything we could. Uh, and that it, but what I would say is that that generated a lot of interest <coughs> and that actually sparked a lot of what we have going on today. So, and I don't know if that's where you, did you see the case from that? Or yes. I, I could remember where he actually saw it, but see, so that gave us him. So that, <laughs> that put us where we are today. So that, that actually was a, was a very good thing to use. So that's it. In memory of the victim, is there any positive information that you could share with us? Like what she liked, what school she went to, anything like that? She referred to the family. She was a wonderful sister. She was obviously she was nine years old at the time. We uh, we watched her grow just like we watched each other grow. Uh, as a uh, sibling, we relied heavily on the compassion and the direction of our parents. We we, we come from good roots. Hopefully, we continue to carry on the examples and the morals that our parents had portrayed to us. Um, our mother reached a point over a number of years where she, exactly, the, I forget, not sure the conditions, but she told us all that she forgave the man that murdered her daughter. Okay. Forgiveness comes from the love, compassion comes from the love. Yeah. Um, she was a wonderful sister. And we, we talked in recent days, obviously, and. Uh, one of the items that we do recall was the days after uh, the incident. Um, we always said grace before meals on certain Sundays, and not every day, but on Sundays and special meals. And my mother would always lead us in grace, but she would always end it with a prayer asking Jesus and Blessed Mother, please help the Pennsylvania State Police find the man that hurt my daughter. She was well liked at school. She was very, a very shy girl. Very shy. We used to tease her a lot because of that. Okay. Um, we have regrets for that, obviously, after we lost her. All right. She loved to play. Uh, we were not a very wealthy family, and uh, my father worked very hard at his business that he had, a grocery store. Uh, my mother worked in a knitting mill uh, to help make ends meet. And one of the things Maurice wanted, uh, which he bring, you know, give hints like many children do when Christmas was coming, and she wanted a, a, to, ha to be able to play the organ, to have an organ. So she had also expressed aspirations to be a nun someday. Okay. So my parents <coughs> did that. They bought her a, 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 an organ. I recall it, they got it over at Sears that was up on Broad Street years ago. And um, that organ is still in good shape today. And we all recall times when we would play the organ with her, not having any notes to follow, just making some noise. But we learned how to repetitively, repetitively make those same noises. So we were in concert when those things happened. <laughs> so very happy girl. The, and the day of you know, that we lost her, it's been written many times, Carmen Marie and, and Barry would always walk to school with Maurice because that's what they did. That's, that was a habit. That particular day, the, Maurice's nun, the sister, St. Teresa, St. Uh, Joseph's School, it was her feast day. You know, if your name was Sister Mary and St. Mary's Day is on the calendar, then you traditionally you bring a gift in to the nun. Okay. Um, that particular day, um, Maurice left a few minutes early so she could take some canned goods that my father gave to her, some fruit, same thing for his mother. And we were bound to go to Catholic Mass every morning during school week at 8 o'clock. So she left early to hurry up, and her little legs, and she did, she went quickly to school. And she was attempting to get them into the classroom so that she could leave there, get to church, sit with her fellow students before she got in trouble for being late. Okay, so that, that's what she did that day. And, and she often talked about being um, a nun. She had the 
admiration for her sister and so forth, but other probably other things. Just okay. a quiet, sweet yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very well liked for her fellow students for sure. Rock and not rap. Anyone have anything else? Yeah, we'll try and answer anything you have. Um, this isn't like some of our other cases where there's prosecution pending where we have to kind of keep some things to ourselves, but we'll answer anything we can. Go ahead, sir. Uh, Robert, it's just in that vein. I was just wondering if there were any other photos in this room. Someone mentioned that earlier that this may be a yearbook photo. Is that kind of it? That's what it looks like. Yeah, that, that's where we obtained that photo from. It's from, a, I think it's a 1959 it's considered paper for yeah, I, I don't know. Know. Mm -hmm. No, it's not like it's a paper. paper. Yeah, but I, mean, I don't know if <coughs> back in the day how they referred to that school. I guess it would be Hazleton High School. But of, of any of the other pictures that we did find, they were later in life. Uh, so this would probably be the closest to when it happened. Because um, he was 22? 22 at 22 the time. At the time so a couple years after high school. <laughs> the, uh, the 1974 sexual assault, where was that? That happened in um, Hazel Township, which we're in now. Uh, happened out near Stockton, um, so it'd be east of Hazelton City, uh, in, a, in a stripping area where they were mining coal. Um, it's out on, a, I believe, on a dirt road out there. Thank you. Anyone else? Where we, we? Oh, sorry, sir. How did you discover the body? How did we discover the body? You know exactly. The story. Um, there was a, I, I believe he was 16 at the time, um, went out to the strip and fit to learn how to drive, I believe, was the, the way that it was written. Um, and his uncle took him. And being as though the dislocation was a stripping pit used for refuse. There were a lot of scrappers back in the day and pickers and they would commonly go and look to see if there was anything of value and uh, the, the day that they discovered Maurice in the, in the strip <coughs> they looked down now obviously it's not there anymore um, that whole area has been reclaimed but um you could, from all the photos that I've ever seen, you could look down into this pit, and they thought that it was a large doll that was just laid there, or, or seemed to have been placed there. And upon closer inspection, they uh, found that it was actually Marie Chivarella. Um And then they notified um, the Hazleton State Police um, trooper Raymond Dobrzelski, who is still with us, he's up in, uh, I believe, Susquehanna County residing. He was the first trooper on scene. Um, confirmed that, you know, the Maurice was deceased. Called back to the barracks, and Detective Sergeant Michael Dean uh, responded out to the scene and started uh, the investigation, and uh, that's how she was discovered. If anybody needs to talk to anybody individually afterwards, you can certainly do that. But we do appreciate everybody coming out today. Thank you. Like I stated in the beginning, we have media packets that we will hand out. If we run out of them and somebody needs one, you just let me know and I can email them. I think I could speak for everybody when we say we're very proud to be here. And we hope that this brings not only closure to the family. I think Corporal Barron said it great when he said that this is also going to bring closure to the Hazleton community. So thank you for attending. Thank you for getting this message out there. We appreciate it on behalf of all members of Troop N. Thank you.